being violated on our continent, and South Africa is not there and it's not leading. Steve, if, if Fudzai is right, then maybe you already co-opted without knowing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, but I, I think, you know, it's, it's quite important that we, we make links of a number of things. I think, Fadzai, when we talk about a CAL or a regional organization working with a country, we also need to then see whether a regional organization has also left the local organization. And this is the importance of the grassroots level, because where is the South African groups in ensuring that they also are in conversation with their own states? And I'm, I'm speaking from that perspective that also part of the organizations that we were all part of the conversation initially and drop down, mm. then we cannot put pressure in a space that we are not there. That's one. Two is that even regionally, South Africa is not uni unique. It's not perfect. And I'm speaking on the basis that we observe and we're part of these spaces that we occupy. But where are the guiding processes to ensure that space is bringing people together, you don't leave anyone behind. Because we, I find that even within the L LGBTI sector, we find ourselves leaving each other behind, and we expect to all be in, in that space. Two is that when we engage about South Africa's role, I can tell you, South Africa do have double standards. Sometimes they speak, sometimes they're quiet. And so you, you ask yourself, as well as a South African, that, oh, God, is our government OK? <laughs> you know? But also, there's a different level of who are we speaking to. And often, when we find us, ourselves only speaking to the bureaucrats or we speaking to the politicians themselves, we have to be consistent with the people that we speak to. And not only from the perspective that we know that they know. We know in our sector, not everyone is pro-LGBTI issues. So you have to start, again, as a sector, empower the people that you're going to talk to. Don't go to them as well expecting that they understand. That is what we're experiencing. In all the people that I work with as well, I find myself having to write an, a, 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 a small note to say, don't address me as a sir. So I have to start empowering this person who are not clear to you, like, how do I address Steve? Do I address Steve as a he or she? So you need to impart that knowledge. So we have too much expectations and we don't impart knowledge. So I'm just challenging ourselves that let's go. We've got this human rights that is challenged holistically and comprehensively about whether it's human rights universal or not. In our own African states, human rights are not universal. So we need to start by educating. We need to start by claiming our space. And we need to all then say, how do we work around? How do we coexist? So that's what I'm challenging, that we are faced with that modus operandi that needs to change in Africa. But it starts with also our movement. OK. Daniela, I recognize you. I'll come to you in a second. I want to bring Rick into the conversation. But before I do that, I just want you to step back a little bit, Fadzai. I mean, the AU itself is very conservative, right, as a state structure on the continent. The South African state, we can debate how liberal or conservative it is. Um, I share your characterization. But despite that, your organization has been willing to fight for observer status. So just talk to me. Is the characterization that you give here one that you assert in dialogue with the AU, with the South African state, or do you adopt a different posture for tactical reasons once you actually present argument for why you should be observer status, have observer status, for example? So how do you, how do you negotiate that, your, your actual views on the state structure, and then still having to think strategically about uh, a state structure as a partner, for better or worse? Um, the approach is very different, um, and even here I find myself feeling a bit schizophrenic because I want to get militant and say, yes, you know, like, <laughs> let's go hard. But then, because a lot of the times you have to sit down with diplomats, you, you know, I've become softer and yeah, trying to be more diplomatic. <laughs> 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 it's terrible. Yes, I have been co-opted. It's, it's, it's really terrible. Um, but yes, the strategy is very, very different. I think one of the things that I've, I've recognized in starting, in starting conversations around sexual orientation is that there, there are two strategies that we use um, with the organizations that we work with. Uh, we use an incremental approach and we use an intersectional approach. 
And so in our conversations with government, state, anything, um, particularly because the work that we're doing, we know is contentious. Um, once we st start talking about LGBTI people only as identities, it also means that we create a certain kind of exceptionalism. And so what we try and do is not take ourselves out of the human race, right? Like the challenges that we experience as LGBTI people aren't outside of the challenges that other people are experiencing. So for example, when we were talking about Cal's observer status, one of the things that we started doing was working with other and, and I can go to state, but I want to start with the Cal process and, and getting observer status. We're starting to work with um, special rapporteurs at the African Commission who are working in various areas of work, right? Who are focused on various human rights um, areas. And the main ones that Cal was working with were the special rapporteur on women human rights defenders because it allows a space in which we can engage not only on issues around sexual orientation and gender identity but also looking at women's rights issues which is really really critical um, and, and then it allows the voice and it allows the understanding that while we may present ourselves as lesbians we are also women we're black women from africa and so at all those points there are various uh, violations that we're experiencing and it's important that we bring those out and not just issues around our sexual orientation and our gender identity. Um, and, and it's a similar kind of strategy when we engage with government too because it's, it's getting the human feel that while you may be opposed to sexual orientation because it's going to be about people who people of the same sex who are having sex, because that's what the conversation is about. They just, it's, it's an mm. aversion to the way we have sex and who we have sex with. Um, so we take it outside of just sex too. We start talking about things that they would not expect us to be talking about. We're gonna be talking about trade. We're gonna be talking about militarization. We're gonna be talking about neoliberalism. So we challenge our states to know that we're not confined into this knowledge of or this body of just sexual orientation and gender identity but we're citizens who are invested and interested in a whole lot more and we understand the ways in which our states are using trade to violate our rights mm. the way in which our states are bargaining human rights in aid of development so we challenge them on those points and say we, we know that for example, at the CSW, you're having conversations around whether to include women's rights or sexual and reproductive health rights as, as a term, and you're trading that off with African states <laughs> for, for development money. So yeah. when the African states give you sexual rights, you give them development. So those kinds of things are the things that we bring to the table, and we try and be diplomatic about that, okay. you know, and just say, we know you, we're watching, and we will let you know that we are watching. <laughs> um, and we will call you out as and when we feel that you, you are really now starting to take the mickey. Danilo, you wanted to jump in here? Yes, uh, I, I would like to comment on the, on the subject of uh, cooperation between um, uh, state and civil society organizations. And this is discussions that we are, that we are having um, for a long time. And uh, for me, what is uh, more uh, interesting uh, to see is that there is a lot of openness um, when it comes to, to health. Yes, um, uh, governments are willingly um, to, to, to include um, LGBT people in, the, in, their, in their documents, um, in their strategic plans, and their wording when it comes to programming, but all is directed uh, to health. But, as Fazai said, when, when you touch the subject of, when you start to make it an identity and claim spaces and claim citizenship as a gay man or a lesbian or a trans person, that becomes problematic. And I started um, my intervention talking about this baby that needs to be registered. That baby has an identity. And for me, it seems a problem that many of our leaders have with identities, with people being, being, being different. And we all are aware as activists that exceptionalism, it's, it's problematic because uh, we know the, the, the struggles our country face uh, to, to provide for, 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 the, for citizens. And we sit around the table and talk about um, LGBT people and our leaders think that it's something special and we need special rights and, and things like that. 
Um, I'm not going to touch the issue of South Africa um, because we all know that South Africa plays double standards when it comes to uh, national and international um, arena. Uh, but uh, I'm, quite, I'm quite scared that we, as an LGBT activist, wanted to make it too mainstream. Yeah. We also end up erasing ourselves from the picture. Because I, I totally agree that we must go and sit around the table and talk about many things. Yeah, because as a, as a citizen, I'm, I'm, I'm a black man, I'm, I'm, I'm a young person. I, the issues around economics, the issues around democratizations of our, of our country also touches me. But if we spread ourselves too thin and just talk about mainstreaming, I'm afraid that also we'll lose our identities. And for me, my identity is not negotiable even when it comes to struggling um, to get mm. rights. So that was... Uh, let's, let's move the conversation and speak more directly about identity. And I want to bring you in here, Ricky. Yeah. For me, as a, as a gay man, a couple of years ago, attending a conference that focused on trans issues that was organized by Liesl with Gender Dynamics was an incredible eye-opener. Um, I think that's the closest I've come to experiencing what it's like to be a straight white man. <laughs> when I realized that the issues that I have as a middle-class gay black man in South Africa are minuscule in comparison with some of the discrimination that trans people face in our society. I took that conversation afterwards, Lisa will remember, uh, onto 702 where I was a radio host at the time. One of my first callers was a gay man from Stellenbosch who said, you know, these people just make it difficult for us to get other people to accept us as gay people. They must stop basically being naughty. And that's an attitude from someone <laughs> inside the acronym LGBTI. So it's interesting listening to the conversation because one of the big strategic conversations in civil society at the moment is the word that everyone banned is about intersectionality. All the struggles are connected. Yeah. For you, and for us, and maybe it will be a learning point for many of us, it is continuously for me, what are the different challenges from the point of view of gen gender expression or gender identity compared to sexual orientation? Because truth be told, although we all mouth the acronym LGBTI, we often forget the T. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eusebius, and thank you to everyone for being here this morning. Um, our struggle is, oh, it's, it's, it's multifold, um, in that we are not the fight that we are, we are facing is not one of sexual orientation in as far as who is it that we choose to sleep with. It's actually an inherent con condition that we, that, that we have in that we feel that we are in the wrong, uh, we're born into, into the wrong body. So, for example, um, myself being, being born male, have the gender expression and gender identity of, as being female because to me, that's an inherent condition, which has nothing whatsoever to do with my sexual orientation. Um, I, could, I could be gay, I could be a lesbian, I could be straight, I could be asexual, for, for that matter. Um, and s listening around, around, around uh, 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 with the other panelists here, the issues that face um, the, 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 the cow and uh, the gay men um, are that much more difficult and that much more compounded in our situation as <coughs> trans people. Because like you, you rightly <laughs> said, we are misunderstood within our own acronym, ac acronym of LGBTI. We, um, a gay man will think we're just being naughty by wearing a dress and wearing a weave, mm -hmm. for example. You know. But that is the, that's the person that we are. And um, that said, you know, it's 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 such there's just so much there's just so much to talk about. But the reason why if I can